socialize with you going forward, but especially with uh, Jenny and also Jenny for having this organization. Um, so the question uh, I want to address today and, and to do, I guess, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, approach. Um, yeah, I, I think your introduction is very apt. Uh, I feel in general, um, I, I take pleasure from being undisciplined um, <laughs> and getting away with giving thoughts on history, and historians, and, and uh, uh, cultural analysis, the cultural studies of people. But when I got invited for this, I thought, can I get away with, can I pass as a sociologist? I don't think I can get away with that. Um, but so, so I'm glad to hear that precisely this interdisciplinary approach that, that you stand for and that you invited me for. So the question I want to address from this interdisciplinary approach is how can we understand the political in the city? So I want to ask where is urban politics located and how do we recognize it as scholars? So an established place to, to look would in general be a municipal government, um, city hall, the mayor of the city, the rival political parties that compete for the urban vote. Can you hear me by the way? So that would be one established place to look. Uh, another would be to look to the national government, to national politicians, whose policies often explicitly target urban problems and urban electorate. Another image that might spring to mind immediately when we think about the political the city would be people protesting in the streets to signal their discontent with precisely those politicians and policies, uh, or to signal their commitment to, to various issues, from women's rights to climate change or, or, or science, as, as we saw. Uh, um, and in urban studies, these have been the sites that both social scientists have concentrated on. So, like formal electoral politics and to some extent social movement, social mobilization in the street. And I think you find this in urban studies across, say, urban studies um, work by political scientists and geographers, but also sociologists and anthropologists. Um, so, so what I want to ask is how might social scientists engage with forms of politics outside of established sites of research, such as those associated with representative democracy or collective mobilization. So in this lecture I want to suggest uh, the need for an alternative, complementary approach to, to this dominant focus on where we find and recognize uh, the political. I want to propose an approach to urban politics that connects insights and methods from the humanities, to those from social science, for instance, by providing long-term urban ethnography and cultural analysis. While much of my engagement with interdisciplinary urban studies is informed by my own background in anthropology, uh, the approach I elaborate here uh, can, I think, also be seen as revisiting the connections between sociology and cultural studies that uh, existed more tightly, let's say, in, in, at the height of the Birmingham Center for Culture, Contemporary Cultural Studies, the Stuart Hall of Management. Um, but, but these ties, I think, between sociology and cultural studies have been loosened over the past couple decades. So I don't actually know why, uh, because this is to some extent a British institutional, uh, was a British institutional moment, and, and, and it's now, I think, uh, largely loosened. Perhaps we can help you through why, and <laughs> if these ties can be tightened again. So the type of urban inquiry that I want to align approaches the intersections between cities, politics, and culture by developing a twin interrelated focus on the political in every neighborhood life and the political imagination. And it's interesting that political imagination, also part of the title of my, uh, my talk, connects to my interest in taking seriously the role of popular culture in urban life. I was trained as a, a traditional social scientist, so I was taught that our role was to study what people did <coughs> and why, primarily by talking to them, also by deep hanging out, sitting around and, and doing whatever they were but we primarily through, through talk. Uh, but definitely there had to be people involved, face-to-face -face contact. Was, uh, very important. Uh, same time, music, visual arts, uh, film, so on. This was seen as the domain of the humanities. So you do this in your free time, you read an album, good for you, but that's basically that's as much research. That could be your hobby. Um, but this disciplinary segregation is increasingly struck me as counterproductive. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, at the University of Australia, we moved the in the media studies, which in the Netherlands is uh, always located in the humanities faculty. Uh, he recently uh, published that field research is too important to be left to the anthropologists, and also to, to area studies. He also included this thing in more liberal field like that. Um, basically, we need to recapture it from the social scientists and as media studies people. We 
also have to go and do field work. I'd like to make the converse argument. Cultural analysis is too important to be left to the humanities. We need to reclaim it within social science. So I find that reading forms of creative expression in relation to power struggles in and over urban space can direct our attention towards negotiations of authority and political belonging that might otherwise be overlooked within our sort of standard social science focus. Um, however, I think it's also important to think through the conceptual and methodological links between the urban everyday and the imaginations, between social practices and popular culture. So not only say, okay, let's do both, but to think uh, concretely and methodologically, how do we use these everyday practices, urban day science that we might study through our social science methodology, how do they connect to these forms of, of the imagination that we can locate and, and uh, dissect through cultural analysis. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in, in this talk is to explore the possibilities of such an approach by focusing on this idea of the political imagination and how everyday practices both feed into and are informed by imaginations of urban rule and citizenships, structures of, of rule and belonging to a political community. An empirical context on which I draw in elaborating this approach is the Jamaican capital of Kingston. Uh, and this book is of course not coincidental, this is, this is uh, where I've worked for um, most of my, my uh, researcher life. Um, but I think it's important to, to use it or to reflect on it also for a minute and to ask uh, an additional question. So how can focusing on a Caribbean city like Kingston help us think differently about urban politics, perhaps not only in general, but also how we, uh, um, I, I know people here who work in all kinds of cities, but um, for those of you who work in cities such as Manchester or London or Amsterdam, Amsterdam is here, but, uh, what can we learn actually from looking at a city like Kingston and applying an approach such as this one to Kingston? How might we then understand a city such as not just for asking them to do Okay. And then the first way I seek to understand the political of the city 
drawn here from political anthropology, but also from sociologists such as uh, Asad Mayat, and interdisciplinary scholars such as Dr. Chatterjee, is through a focus on everyday urban life. So to look at the political authentic, we should be studying through everyday spaces and practices. So as I mentioned uh, at the start, I think this involves looking beyond formal representative politics, so beyond political parties, politicians, the state. The political processes also become visible through other, less formal interactions and enactments in everyday life. So first of all, this, this means taking seriously other types of power holders than elected politicians and state officials. So this broader perspective on politics should, of course, include a focus on power that lies in collective mobilizations and more or less institutionalized social movements. So, so that's sort of second established focus. But in addition, I think there's other less recognized power holders we can look at. So, my own ethnographic research has looked, for instance, at the role that criminal leaders known as dons have been governing Kingston's inner city neighborhoods. Uh, but I'm also, in the context of the book that um, uh, Nicola mentioned, studying the influence of environmental NGOs, but also major corporations such as Shell on urban development, so to look how actually established uh, politics with the parties connected politicians might not be the primary drivers in how the city develops spatially and socially. We might actually find other actors who are at least as influential. Studying the political and everyday life also involves doing research in other spaces of power than just, say, um, parliament or the city hall. So the formally sanctioned arenas for engaging in political debate uh, by shaping governance. So this means expanding the focus to study, ethnographically or otherwise, what happens on the streets? How can we understand the street as a political space? How can we understand back rooms, either of corporations or, or of the same uh, government building, perhaps? Uh, how are shady bathrooms uh, and bars? Uh, how is a water cooler also a space where power struggles to uh, But also, how can we see churches as important political sites in any city of Of course, not only churches, but also mosques and temples and synagogues. Um, so I think we need to shift our, our spatial focus also away from established sites uh, of political power. Mm -hmm. At the same time, analyzing the political and everyday life doesn't mean ignoring formal representative politics. It also requires developing new ways of looking at those processes and sites. For instance, by doing electoral ethnography. So not just counting the votes, or seeing who wins, what is the outcome in terms of um, Counts, you know, who which seats, uh, what percentage voted for whom, uh, or even how is that distributed geographically across the city, how many people in which order voted for whom. Um, but walking with or, or talking with or voting with, that's kind of hard in most cases. Um, but really taking the act of voting uh, seriously as a meaningful act that goes beyond an outcome of being or lose. So in Jamaica, this helped me understand how, in so-called garrison neighborhoods controlled by politically connected zones, residents understand voting not so much as a political right, but actually as a duty. Voting here becomes a mandatory expression of allegiance to their neighborhood, to the gang, and the political party that together have shaped that specific territory. So voting is something you have to do. Uh, it's actually something people feel they don't have a choice other than to vote for a specific party. So it, it's not a right, it's not ideological choice, but it, it's a mandatory expression of your allegiance to a specific space uh, and the politics that have shaped that space. So in addition to focusing on, on this everyday, uh, and sometimes you know, slightly less everyday, so like it's not necessarily everyday, but these everyday spaces and practices. Um, the second way of researching the political is that to focus on the role of the imagination. But political imagination can be found in art, in literature, popular culture, the boundaries, of course, between these are quite blurry. So it, it varies aesthetic practices and forms of creative expression. And I use the word imagination here rather than representation, though these are also your boundaries, because these forms of creative expression do not only represent the existing political realities, although they do, they absolutely do, offering alternative imaginings of the status quo. But actually, this reimagining of, of the now, of, of the status quo, is an especially crucial function in those situations where actual political change might appear impossible, or might actually be impossible. And the imagination enables endurance rather than improvement. So, uh, authors working on, uh, for instance, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, where for decades no progress, no change was actually seen to be 
possible at all. Uh, the imagination in terms of it enduring and, and surviving uh, an insufferable reality as opposed to imagining a project of political progress or change. Um, so this, this, this sort of reimagining of the now and in that sense representing is uh, for me definitely part of the imagination. But in addition, what the work of the imagination does is to actively envision new horizons, future realities, to envision the world otherwise, to assert that another world, or in this context, another city, is possible. <coughs> so these forms of political imagination, these reimaginings of, of the now and the future, work as analytical, normative, and effective forces. <coughs> this means that they guide us in our understandings of how power works, and where and in whose hands it's concentrated. So our attention is drawn to specific locations of power and responsibility or authority, and not to other, other sites. So for instance, it draws our attention to a specific local, national, or international scale of, of authority and responsibility. In addition, the political imagination shapes our perceptions of the workings of power as either just or unjust, and it, it shapes whether we respond to these workings with anger or with pride, with sadness or excitement. So a more, both a normative response, and is this the right way, is this how power should work, is this how decisions should be taken, is this how distributions of risk and resources um, should be aligned, but also how we respond to that as affecting the world of Beyond delineating the sites and mechanisms of power, the political imagination is also central in how we come to see ourselves in relation to others, whether it's the locations in the city or precisely beyond uh, those same physical sites. So with whom do we feel affinity or community? Uh, and with whom do we feel social differentiation in terms of authority and hierarchy? How does that shape we get with our everyday life? We could also understand the political imagination as frameworks that suggest specific attributions of causality and blame, but also distributions of rights and responsibilities that we often associate with citizenship. So for instance, such frameworks and imaginative frameworks connect to specific understandings of the causes of urban poverty and violence. Whose fault is it if a city or a neighborhood suffers from high levels of um, conflict and deprivation? Um, so who's culpable? And who might be able to remedy this? Who's capable of affecting change? Reshaping these, uh, these inequalities or these problems. Um, who should and who can protect vulnerable citizens? the state, or is it other power holders? To what established or perhaps yet to be realized in the local community does one belong? And what rights or responsibilities accompany this belonging? So these analytical, normative, and effective phrases can legitimize or delegitimize specific distributions of resources or risks, such as the concentration of wealth in specific locations or specific population groups within the city. Um, they can legitimize or delegitimize the social spatial distribution of violence and environmental rights. Oh, it's okay if that neighborhood is polluted because those people are, are dirty and nasty and undeserving to start with. Or so I say, oh, but those are innocent people and they should be protected from um, uh, air pollution or garbage. So these imaginative frames can normalize or denaturalize specific structures of decision making. For instance, shifting our sense of how political decisions should be taken, implemented, and enforced. For instance, shifting them from a preference for top-down violent authoritarianism towards a preference for electoral democracy or horizontal um, collective action or vice versa. Let me say vice versa for three things. Shifting these preferences uh, in various directions. I think it's also important to note at this point that there's a widespread tendency to understand the political imagination, especially when located in the culture or the marginalized populations um, as progressive and emancipatory. So what I want to also show is the empirical examples of these. This isn't necessarily the case at all. There's many types of imagination that connect to violent or exclusionary types of political practice and actors. I think it's urgent that we also attend to the more dystopian potentials of imaginative engagement and see them as necessarily uh, progressive. Um, okay. So in any city, multiple forms of political imagination will compete and coincide. What is their relation to everyday encounters? How are they mobilized? In which forms do they become dominant? How do these imaginations inform or impede political action? In short, how can we connect our analysis of everyday political practices, spaces, and actors? How can we connect that analysis 
uh, to one of the political imagination as it's located in expressive culture. So how does the imagination feed that everyday life? And how is everyday politics enabled through the work of the imagination? So what are the relations between imagination and the political everyday, if I can call it that? I think uh, I should stress first of all that these relations are not causal in any unidirectional sense. And that the imagination is not so much a concrete, causative object or subject, but rather an ongoing process. But Audrey Lord uh, describes this succinctly in her analysis of poetry in relation to women's struggles, for which I would read political struggles over the context of, of this uh, talk, urban struggles. Um, so for her, she says, the poetry, and here we can read uh, art a more broadly. Poetry is, on the one hand, the revelation or distillation of experience. It's rooted in, but also departs from, lived experience, lived reality. On the other hand, poetry is necessary in order to act on that reality. So, for women then, Lord continues, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless, so it can be thought. The farthest external horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. So for me, this is a, a beautiful poetic uh, analysis actually, of how the imagination relates to root and daily experience. Now, in an urban context, researching the relations between daily lives and the imagination needs attending, first of all, to how the imagination is made material, in embodied fashion, in the context of the social and built environment of concrete streets and neighborhoods. Um, so trying to understand how this imagination might be made material, um, I draw on anthropological work on politics, aesthetics, and everyday practices of sensory perception. For instance, in their work on uh, sensory citizenship, Susanna Trinka, Christine Duro, and uh, Julie Park highlight the significance of the embodied sensing of the world in the formation of political subjects and communities. They suggest that sensory differentiation is central in the processes of inclusion and exclusion that structure the boundaries of citizenship. So our experience of social sameness and difference works through emotionally loaded senses of vision, hearing, smell, and so on. Uh, relatedly, in her work on the aesthetics of persuasion, uh, Birgit Bayer, another anthropologist, argues similarly for a sensorial turn in our understanding of the political imagination. She places a more explicit emphasis on the role of materiality. So what she does is to emphasize that for the, the imagination to be experienced as real, as meaningful, in an embodied fashion, it must be made material. So she argues that, I quote, more attention needs to be paid to the role played by things, media, and the body in actual processes of community making. So for uh, a community as an um, uh, imagined uh, community to actually be made meaningful, we can only look at its imagination through text, uh, as we find it in Benedict Anderson style, but to look how, how those texts become uh, meaningful, how they come to feel real in an everyday embodied sense, through which objects, which spaces, um, but particularly through which bodily um, perception are these imaginations made real, made meaningful. In addition, in our own focus on the religious mediation of community, Bayer's work deliberately focuses on what she calls aesthetic formations beyond the nation state and beyond democratic politics. So look how, looking at how um, uh, imagination of religious communities may be in a um, combination of media, bodies, objects, Spaces. So in my own work, I've drawn on this type of approaches, aesthetic approaches, um, in researching the popular culture associated with dominionship. So exploring how the formation of political communities around Yons, around these particular leaders, and their neighborhood territories is intimately connected to the emotional and ethical work that a range of popular culture texts, images, sounds, and performative practices do within specific urban spaces. Uh, so looking for uh, dance hall lyrics that celebrate dance, looking at uh, dances organized to commemorate the sea stars or the birthdays of living ones or, or annual um, celebratory dances for a specific gang, a specific neighborhood. Uh, but looking not only at, at the text or, or the fact of such a dance existing, but understanding what it does, um, what, what uh, physical sensations it 
provokes and how those collective sensations uh, give rise to a, a real feeling of political community within a specific built environment. Um, so for me, such a combination of popular culture analysis, looking indeed at the lyrics, uh, at the images of, of deceased dance that are painted uh, as bureaus on the walls, uh, looking at, at, at what is said and what dances are danced uh, during a certain street dance, so taking popular culture seriously in its own right, analyzing it as a cultural expression, but combining it with neighborhood level ethnography, to me shows how aesthetic forms render a specific imagination of dance authority both real and powerful, both in and through the built environment. So through the walls on which the murals are painted, through the streets in which dance parties celebrate dance, allow people to physically experience their shared location, uh, their literally shared location within a specific system of rule and the dance. So such approaches can help us understand the aesthetic, sensory processes through which the political imagination comes to literally move people in a certain direction, or uh, conversely, by immobilize them. In addition, though, it's also important to understand how specific urban environments and their material and social forms enable or constrain new forms of political imagination. So what is the relation between this material environment, social environment, their overlaps and intersections, um, and new forms of political imagination. In their work on the technologies of the imagination, as they call it, David Smith, Martin Mubelak, and Martin Axel Peterson, direct our attention to the generative capacity of specific technological implements and artifacts. Now they focus, they're not interested in the urban per se, uh, on, on different types of technology, from software to electricity infrastructure, and ask how these enable specific forms of imagination. Drawing on insights from science and technology studies, this means attending to urban, uh, I think it's urban, affordances that are both social and material. Um, now affordances are those specific conditions or artifacts that enable or constrain, but do not determine, specific outcomes. The introduction of specific objects and forms of social organization, of particular styles of architecture, such as public housing projects, in the case of the Nelson elsewhere. Um, to guns, a very important part of that. To ballot boxes, and the electoral organization they are associated with. Um, these specific tools, I think we could call them, can be connected to the generation of specific forms of the imagination, and some I'll touch on in my examples uh, shortly. Um, but a longer exploration of such processes in Kingston, for instance, um, might lead us to trace the imaginative affordances of social material objects such as the public housing projects associated with, on the one hand, urban modernity, but also with partisan politics that were so central to, to the rise of donmanship. Um, we could also look at the introduction of guns and drugs in the context of Cold War politics, um, and how these were, were intimately associated with, but also enabled specific types of imagination uh, of King's neighborhoods in a global context uh, with the gun. Uh, enabling the imagination of conquering communism or precisely um, the, uh, liberating uh, the poor from, from capitalist oppression. Uh, but we might also look at the, the Westminster parliamentary system, which was introduced to Jamaica as a, a former British colony, um, and its privileging of the secret ballot, the Helms ballot itself, the, the ballot box, um, which, which could be stolen by dogs or stuffed by, by people who uh, felt that they had a duty to vote in a certain way. Um, how all this electoral technology also afforded specific imaginations of political community of, of rights and responsibilities. Um, so those are longer explorations that, that I, I won't uh, um, uh, go into here, but in the context of the lecture, I have time for just a few brief empirical illustrations of the connections between the political imagination and everyday practices. Um, I'll focus on violence protection and authority in Kingston. These examples connect my previous research of, on dance, which I uh, can't seem, seem to completely see as finished, it sort of seeps into my current work. Um, and they're looking at them and their entanglement with electoral politics, but connecting it to my current work on security assemblage, the subject I mentioned, which looks at the practices and imaginations of security provision beyond the state, uh, but increasingly, uh, I invite you to think here with me, security provision beyond the human. Um, so what I want to do is through a discussion of, of reggae and dancehall music, these, these first three texts, uh, and also uh, visual culture, looking at um, uh, 
three works by, by one artist, by Kofi Kelly. I want to uh, also draw on my long-term ethnographic um, research in Kingston to consider how these forms of imagination enable or repeat the emergence and consolidation of new political subjectivities uh, and new forms of political action. So I'm going to start with a discussion of uh, three recent reggae and dancehall songs to explore how policing and protection are imagined in the context of realities of poverty and violence in Kingston. But to look also at how the music proposes normative statements about the legitimacy and efficacy uh, of different security actors that can be read in multiple, but also I think contradictory ways. Um, so I, I want to look at uh, uh, reggae and dancehall songs to ask um, who, who is being uh, attributed with the authority to protect, uh, who, is, who is seen as being capable of protecting, which, which is too distinct with often entangled things. So the one hand, uh, what is the imagined role of the police or other state forces? These are the uh, non-state security providers. But also, uh, what does it mean when we see a, a turn uh, beyond the state, to, to more, uh, sorry, beyond the human, to, to more than human uh, sources of protection, uh, and uh, often related to sources of authority. Uh, but also to ask you, what responsibilities do citizens have vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the police, or perhaps other protectors? Uh, is it uh, just these uh, law abiding, or do we see processes of responsabilization uh, where actually self protection um, becomes more central? Um, and third, I, I don't think I can offer an exhaustive uh, answer to all these questions based on three songs, but, but these are the questions that, that frame my, uh, my analysis. Um, if we see that almost everywhere protection and security is, is intimately tied up with authority or legitimate authority, um, what does that derive from, maybe? Is it security itself, or is it justice um, related to transgressions of, uh, or violations of, uh, uh, of the integrity, for instance? Is it, is it capacity to protect, or is it justice that is, is primary? Um, or are there other sources of authority? Uh, okay, I want to start with a reimagination um, of the relations between the Jamaica Consanity Force, the JCF, um, a resident of, of inner city neighborhoods in downtown Kingston, but look at Ray Artist Wasp's hit song, Unfair Officer. So, so I'm starting here with a discussion of, of, of three recent uh, songs to, to focus first on, on policing and in the broad sense. Um, so, what, what the song does, but uh, I want to also show you the video clip, um, is to, what the song and the clip both do is to depict the specific type of engagement between the police and the ACF and inner city residents, negotiations over street dances, over who gets to use public space and which place, and also at what time, and how loudly do they get to use it. So the role of the JCF in enforcing the Noise Abated Act by blocking off such dances as it, at a given hour is sometimes interpreted as part of broader state or elite strategies to curtail <coughs> the livelihoods and cultural expressions of the urban poor, specifically of the black and the darker skinned urban poor. Uh, so the song, unfair. <coughs> Basically, it boils down to say how unfair it is that the police is coming to lock off the dance. Uh, especially, later on, it says, so you need a permit to have the dance. So the permit stops at 2, and it's 2.21. So how can you lock it off already? Because it's only 21 minutes over the same time. <laughs> so um, <coughs> this is a bit of a detail, but uh, so the general context is a negotiation over who gets to say what the dance is done. Um, and I find that songs such as Unfair Officer present the JCF's intervention street dances as part of a larger historical logic. So the police is not there to protect. Um, so we know for a fact that a fight gets me before we were born. So from way before I was born, me as a young person from, from the ghetto, uh, the police is here to fight me them, they are fighting me, they're not here to help me, they're not here to protect me, they're basically here to make my life difficult. Um, I see this type of historical contextualization as, as echoing uh, Pat Maxwell and David uh, Featherstone's move to understand security, specifically Caribbean security, in light of longer trajectories of colonial endangerment, and to understand how these trajectories inform contemporary economic and physical precarity <coughs> of residents of Jamaica's voting public. So this is one sort of historical genealogy uh, in which WASP uh, places this type of interaction. I think 
we, we went to all kinds of effort to, to get music and uh, video. Uh, audio, so I should also uh, let you um, uh, see. Because what I want to show you is um, that what WASP does is, is narrate the knockoff not just as a confrontation, but as a space for negotiation. And this narrative reimagination of, of what's often experienced as a colonial form of policing is supported sonically and visually through the music and accompanying video. So he hints at the possibility of paying off the police. Uh, it seems like they're going to care worse enough than to spare. So um, uh, they're worse than the fact that they don't care. I don't have any money to bribe them to pay them off. Um, so there's, there's that part of the negotiation. But in general, what he does um, in, in, in the lyrics, but also verbally uh, and with his voice as, as part of the entreaty, uh, is to appeal to the officers for empathy, suggesting that dance hall parties offer an important form of nonviolent sociality. So he treats them to understand street dances not just as noise, a nuisance, but as the ghetto youth's own attempts at peace and conflict resolution. So say, you know, officer, the big things, come make the ghetto youth that want to hold up peace, man from west to east, so different warring um, uh, neighborhoods, sections of the city. I'd rather see a dance than a funeral piece. So wouldn't you also rather see us dancing than keeping it a funeral? So let me just play a bit. Of the sun, I beg your please. Come and look at them, they want to pull off the breeze. You want to grab the voice of that keys. But let us sit down, stand, sit in our galaxy. The dark of the soul of the sun. I'm more like it than me for the soul of the sun. Hey, when the music's not played, I can get down and the shots that my head goes and say, We have to know them. Then the music's played of the sun. The mother made me think so, you must play of the sun. So very bass heavy, very electronic, um, very loud, of course. Um, rapid music, which is often interpreted, including things that as, as aggressive. Um, the whole sound and feel, the visual look of the video is much more mellow. Um, so I think uh, while there is a confrontation going on in, in the video, so you see a, a soul officer who is addressed in the sort of a, um, special forces uniform. Um, at the same time, a much less confrontational relationship is, is being imagined, uh, I would say, sonically and visually. So, so a less confrontational relationship between citizens and police is bolstered by the slow, melodic, root reggae style of the music, in contrast to the faster, more electronic bass and sounds of dancehall, but also in the, I would say, dreamlike, soft focus quality of the video. And it's the depiction of not just the officer, but also dancers, or dancing, or your bottle is there. Like, uh, DJs and the residents. Um, so on the one hand, we, we have this move to imagine um, citizen police relations <coughs> otherwise. At the same time, both in this video and, and almost everywhere else, uh, the JCF are rarely imagined as an effective, legitimate source of, of protection or authority. Reggae artists are, are more likely to imagine protections located in the divine, making a statement about the rule of law or for Rastafari job in providing both physical and spiritual security. So in his song, um, Most High, for instance, Chronics, uh, one of the, the biggest uh, roots reggae stars currently, praises Ja, 
asserting that you're the reason I'm not in the work yet. You're the reason I'm still alive. It's you who gives me peace in my heart. Even all when we get rich, even when I get rich with three bodyguards and some big bad dog in the yard, even then the job will be actually the primary source of protection. So I find it interesting for multiple reasons. Uh, on the one hand, the, the police are never a part of the picture here, so sort of standard place you would go for security if you get rich is um, on the one hand a human, so private security guards, but also these big bad dogs. They keep popping up in, in, in songs about security. So that's actually what started the other track of this war that you get. Like, what is the role of dogs in all of this? You never stop to consider sort of the, the interspecies of uh, function of security in the urban landscape. Um, but at the same time, the, I think that the big bad dogs here are, are secondary. It's really about about, ja, about the most high. Uh, let me display this one for you. outside of this, this context of, of urban violence and endangerment. Um, so for me, it's also a way of thinking, OK, well, where, does, where does protection lie? What sources of policing, uh, of security, are being imagined when the police doesn't work and basically don't have money to pay for these uh, private uh, bodyguards, even though even low-income people will, will have a, a big damn dog. Um, so, so here we see a move not just beyond the state, but also beyond human. Uh, but other artists make a different comparison, contrasting God or Jah with dogs. So this takes me back to the dogs. Uh, and in his song, God Amidon, God is my dog, it's a dance hall artist conscience makes a similar metaphorical connection between different sources of protection, likely God or <coughs> Jah to the dawn as an extra legal security protector. So in this song, we see an omniscient Jah providing an invisible but most effective kind of surveillance and protection. So God can distinguish between threat and non-threat, as gods are also alleged to be able to do. Um, and it's a powerful link uh, or social connection. Um, so I try to sound to be glad. Most of the patois is more or less translatable to English, but it is important to know what these links are. So in general, in Jamaica, there's a thesis for the, the PhD uh, kind of studying uh, social capital, which was more than one. The idea of links in Jamaica is incredibly important. The idea that to get ahead, you need links, you need these connections, you need these networks. Uh, and this, this uh, includes that in the field of, of security protection, you need to have a link. Um, so basically, the, you see God, that's my dawn. Um, if I can say anything, I don't have to hide. Um, you know, if people try to fight, then they'll drop, because even if they have all kinds of links, God is the, the right contact. God is my, ja is my link for links. Um, so anywhere I go, you know, I'll, I'll never leave um, that link behind. The link is always there with me, even when you don't see anyone beside me. Um, ja is always there. Ja knows everything. He knows who's praying for my downfall. Uh, he knows who, who are my enemies, who are my friends, even though they might exist. And here, this is, this, this is the words from standard of that social. Stop. 
uh, in Cold War politics and beyond. So who, who, which individuals or which parties, which populations are seen as responsible, but also where, this again becomes the, the urban question, that, uh, where are these sources of violence, um, sources of, of pathology, perhaps, where are they located spatially, where, where do we find them in the city? Do we find them only in low-income neighborhoods, do we find them also in wealthier neighborhoods, is it perhaps not just an urban issue, but one uh, that's, that's pervasive at the level of the nation, or should we look more broadly, and for instance, in the context again of, of the Cold War history, uh, within which dominantship um, emerged, or uh, within the cocaine trails, which stretch from Bolivia to the US and, and Europe, and to make this a sort of coincidentally geographically in the middle. Um, so, uh, Michael Flynn uh, Elliott has, he has a series of pictures, Donopoly 1 and 2. Um, another one called Donopoly Deception, but well, I really didn't know how to analyze that one. So. But I think what, what he does in his first uh, two monopoly uh, pictures is to trace the connection between dominantship uh, and the fragmentation of urban space through electoral violence and, and what is called his uh, garrison politics. So where, where one neighborhood would become associated with one of the two political parties, either GOP or PNP, because politicians distributed guns and money to the dons to get out the vote in these areas. Um, so uh, this first done uh, it shows a number of uh, uh, low-income garrisons, Tivoli Gardens, you know, it's the mother of all garrisons, it's called Denham Town. These are two JLP or green areas, so they become green on the Donopoly board. You know, there's also things done in jail that you could visit in. Um, at Arnett Gardens, um, you see also JPS code, the electricity company. You see also the orange uh, PMP neighborhoods. Um, <coughs> And you see various soldiers pointing their guns um, at, um, yeah, at, at each other, I think, to some extent. But it's, uh, it's likely that these are not necessarily government soldiers, but, but got them from the neighborhood. So if you look at this, you say, OK, Donopoly, it's a game, or maybe the Dons have a monopoly over urban space, guns are charged, this is where violence comes from. All you see here is the low income areas. So, to me, this initially is not a, a very, or, or this, this image ties very much into dominant ideas that violence comes from and is a problem of inner city neighborhoods and poor people. So there is this very pervasive imagination of, of the culture of poverty associated specifically with uh, poor, darker skinned Jamaicans. Um, so then he came up with um, Donopoly 2. This shows another part of the board game. Um, and here, so here you don't see orange or green, they see blue, blue colored uh, neighborhoods, Kirkland Heights, Cherry Gardens, two of the most luxurious, um, wealthiest neighborhoods, it's also where the luxury taxes. Um, and here again, you, you see these uh, soldiers, you also see a luxury car. Um, and to me, this, this is also saying, like, hmm, maybe the source of violence, uh, especially Kirkland Heights, is known for a place where, uh, on the one hand, criminals. Um, will park their money by building new houses, uh, but also where, where they find protection from uh, say any, any type of police incursion that might happen downtown. Uh, but also where the political and business elites who, who still rely on, on guns for, for various uh, electoral and other services uh, tend to be based. So to me, this is a, a different spatialization of the sources of, of violence um, that, that continue to affect uh, Mainly downtown, but, but uh, causes fear amongst almost everyone. So for me, this is already a, a shift in, in the spatial sort of uh, explanation, spatial causality uh, of urban violence. Uh, but then he has a final piece, uh, which isn't part of the same series, but it's called National Dish. Uh, so you can tell it's very photorealistic uh, style. Um, and uh, this was also part of the, uh, the like the Biennale, the, the, the National Gallery of Art. Um, and to me, this is, uh, on the one hand, again, a, a, a spatial scaling up to say it's actually not just a urban problem, a national dish. We seem to have a national appetite for violence. Uh, so in that sense, say it's not just something that takes place in, in Kingston's inner city neighborhoods or even also wealthier neighborhoods. It's a natural preoccupation, a natural obsession. Um, which could, on the one hand, be seen as a, as a progressive move to say, okay, this is not just a, an urban thing, but to me, it's also culturalist to say, like, we love violence, we love to eat it for, you know, for breakfast, for dinner. And in that sense, 
it does recuperate this evangelization, uh, which is quite pervasive in, in Jamaica and beyond, that Jamaica is somehow exceptionally violent, sort of prone to excessive violence more than other cultures or other people. Um, and, and the artwork that did materialize, um, I don't know that it will, uh, is one that looks beyond both the city and the nation and says, what about, where do these guns come from? Where do the drugs come from? Where do they go to? So, so that spatial framing of, of power, uh, of sources of violence, remains absent in this uh, visual imagination. Um, so, so I think these, these images do visualize the imagination that constructs an alternative framework of social spatial causality and culpability uh, in relation to urban violence by like focusing on the complicity um, of political and economic elites, um, even though it, it could go another uh, step further. Uh, and in terms of how this connects to everyday practices or, or everyday say, shifts in new practices and their beliefs, I think uh, what these works do is, is connect to uh, an increased cynicism vis-a-vis -vis electoral politics. So by, by showing um, red and green as completely uh, complicit with, with the production of, of violence, um, it's also part of delegitimizing de um, the role of, of elected politics in, in shaping uh, urban space. But at the same time, what has also changed in the past decades is the levels of electoral violence. So where in the 1980s, or, um, the 1980 election was the height of, of electoral violence, so 800 people died in, in these turf battles over Chimney Gardens versus uh, Arnett Gardens. That is also to be lived. So the cynicism with which we see increasing vis the elected politicians is also connected to, uh, um, and I think the cynicism you see in, in this type of uh, images, uh, also connects to an unwillingness to die uh, for political parties. So while people still might feel compelled and you know, a duty to vote, they no longer feel a duty to kill other people of the politics. Um, and, and this, I think, uh, this type of imagination has directly told us this recognition that violence um, need not be an outcome of, of uh, political electoral imaginations, I think, uh, has real effects in, in everyday uh, political practice. Um, okay, two quick blue. Um, it's a shiny, shiny picture. Um, in any urban context, multiple forms of the political imagination are formulated and reformulated in an ongoing process. In popular culture, in government policies, in visual culture, in the news media, an entire range of sites of creative expression. And while these different imaginative frames may seem competitive, I think as complex human beings, we are able to simultaneously engage with apparently conflicting possibilities for perceiving and acting on our everyday lives and encounters. So one formulation does not necessarily dislodge another. They may also overlap and bleed into each other in unanticipated way. So what I've tried to do in this presentation is to suggest um, developing new perspectives on urban politics that build on but extend our focus on the state. Um, that, uh, I think it's still important to work with approaches to citizenship, political belonging, that look on the one hand at legal formal um, types of, of um, citizenship, so for instance, uh, the jury equality of citizenship rights and contrast that with substantive dimensions in terms of the de facto uneven distributions of resources and risks among citizens. So it's a very common focus when we look at citizenship or urban citizenship. What is there on paper and what's the difference in, in real life? I think that's an important but perhaps not fully sufficient approach to understand the scope and dynamics of contemporary urban struggles. And connecting these social science traditions and approaches with the cultural analysis that attends to the political imagination might allow us to recognize where new legal and extra legal possibilities are being conceived. So not only what is the law, what is the current status of the law, has the law being applied, but also what new legal possibilities um, are, are being imagined that we might enact. Also what extra legal possibilities are being conceived. Also how is differentiated citizenship normalized? Um, so what it, even if it's a fact or not sure, how do people come to see it as normal? Uh, but at the same time, what grounds for contestation are being envisioned? These things we might not uh, find articulated so easily uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, an interview question or even you know, an attentive uh, ethnographic look, but we might find them before they crystallize in everyday practice, we might find them uh, in art and popular culture. So this brief illustration of Kingston as a site of political action and meaning making is only one example 
of an approach that takes the political imagination seriously. I want to end um, by connecting also to ongoing debates on global urbanism. Um, so I don't know if all of you are urbanists to say, but um, these, these uh, authors such as Jennifer Robinson and Anna Yerboi, we looked at what are the geographies of Syria, which uh, urban cases do we propose uh, concepts that, that then are sort of sent into the world as, as universal concepts. So I want to stress that while this example is specific to Jamaica, uh, we might be able to use the insights that such an approach generates to ask new questions of urban politics in cities like Manchester, Amsterdam, as I started with. So challenging the established geographies of urban theorization can help shed light on the role of informed or irregular governance actors uh, such as Sudan's, but there may be counterparts that are less spectacular or less immediately recognizable as criminals. Um, but uh, we could also look at the role of spirituality in politics, something that I think is almost entirely understudied in, in European cities. We might look at the very ways in which party affiliation shapes urban space through both everyday life and the work of the imagination. So I think sometimes it's hard to study precisely these things in, uh, in European cities because we're so used to classifying them or categorizing them as, as global south politics or, or you know, informal politics, but we don't have that here because we have a uh, system system uh, or different type of uh, electoral system. So it's perhaps precisely the, the dominant uh, self-imagination of efficiency and transparency uh, in urban politics that, that uh, precludes the actual prevalence of, of informal uh, and, and spiritual understandings and practices of, of Thank you.